As we uh, continue this morning in our series on Route 66, today we come to the book of Esther. And um, I want to start this morning by just giving you a brief recap of the story of Esther and then look at some of the main truths that we can apply to our own lives from the book of Esther. Now, with every book and every story of the Bible, God has given it to us not just to be a nice story, but so that we can learn truths that he's put in there and we can apply them in our own lives. And so I want to look at the story of Esther and then some important truths that we can apply in our own lives. So uh, actually, the order of the books of the Bible goes Ezra, and Nehemiah, Esther, but in, in chronology, uh, Esther actually falls in the middle of the book of Ezra and before the book of Nehemiah. And so this slide gives a little snapshot. It's a little hard to, hard to see up there, but um, Ezra, it, it takes place over um, a span of about 80 years, and the book of Esther happens during the book of Ezra. So about, about 600 B.C., Jerusalem was captured by the Babylonians, and they're taken into captivity into Babylon. Then about 70 years later, Persia cap captures uh, the Babylonian Empire while the Jews are still living in Babylon. Then Ezra focuses on uh, the rebuilding of the temple. A man named Zerubbabel goes back and he rebuilds the temple for about 22 years. And then there's a big gap, and then Esther uh, sorry, Ezra goes back to Jerusalem and restores the people and the worship of God. And in between that gap, which comes in between Ezra's chapter 6 and 7, the story of Esther takes place. But it focuses on the Jewish people living back in Persia. So Ezra and Nehemiah focus on the Jews going back to Jerusalem, because they've been given an edict by the king of Persia, the new king in town. Um, he has allowed them to go back to their homeland, and so they do that. But the book of Esther focuses on Jews staying in Persia, and uh, that's, that's where we are. Right in the middle of the book of Ezra, the book of uh, Esther takes place back in Persia. So the story of Esther opens up telling us about a king named Xerxes. And it focuses on this party that he's having for six months long. Any of you ever had a party that you've thrown for six months? Well, this guy, he's a, he's a big party boy. He's a big shot. He has a party for 180 days. He wants to show how wealthy he is, so it's really opulent. It takes place in a palace, and it lasts for six months long. And, and, and toward the end of this six-month-long party, he wants to show off his trophy wife, uh, Queen Vashti. So he wants her to come out so all the men can see how beautiful she is. And she's not that into that. She doesn't want to do that, so she tells him no. And King Xerxes doesn't like to be told no. Uh, so, so he, along with his advisors, they make a decree that all women must obey whatever their husbands tell them to do. Well, some of you men may like that, the idea of that, but this, this guy was, was kind of a jerk. And... Uh, <laughs> He, um, he, he says, you know what, it also sounds like we need a new queen. And so he puts on a, a beauty pageant so that he can find the most beautiful new queen that, that he can find. And he ends up becoming infatuated with, with a young girl named Esther. So much so that he makes her queen. So she is the new queen in Persia. And uh, Esther has an adoptive father named Mordecai. And Mordecai is actually Esther's cousin, older cousin, but Esther's parents died when she was young, and Mordecai adopted her as his daughter. Now, Mordecai gets a job at the temple in Persia, and one day while he's working, he hears about an assassination plot to kill the king of Persia. And he, Mordecai, tells Esther about this assassination plot to kill the king, and Esther steps in, and she tells the king and gives Mordecai credit for saving the king's life. And the king records this whole instance down in his book of history of his reign. It goes in the record books. Now, some time passes, and we're told that this man named Haman is one of the... He, he's a very top official in the Persian Empire. He's really high up there. And um, he is really into himself... And 
he wants everyone to bow down to him as he goes throughout the city. And everyone does that. Everyone worships Haman as he goes around, around town, and everyone except for Mordecai. And so this really bothers Haman. He does not like not being worshipped. He doesn't like not being bowed down to. And he finds out that Mordecai is, is a Jew. And so it's not enough in Haman's mind to just kill Mordecai. He wants to kill all of the Jews. So he goes to the king of Persia, and he, and he tells him about this, and he also pays a lot of money, and he says, we need to kill all of the Jews. So long story shorter, they set a date for the following year, which happens to be March 7th of the following year. They're going to go through, and they're going to kill all of the Jews. They're gonna, there's going to be a genocide of the Jews. Now Mordecai hears about this, and he goes into deep mourning. He tears his clothes, he's, he's weeping, he's fasting. And Ezra hears about Mordecai's distress, and she says, what's going on? Why are you so distraught? And Mordecai tells Esther, well, all of the Jewish people are going to be killed. You need to go in and you need to tell the king about this, and you need to ask him for mercy. And Ezra says, I, I can't do this. Um, if I go into the king's throne room unannounced, he can, he can kill me immediately, even as the queen. And if she went in there without the king's acceptance, she could be killed immediately. And Mordecai encourages her. He says, don't think that you can escape this law. Perhaps you were made for queen. You were made queen for such a time as this. So Esther takes this to heart, and she puts her life on the line, and she goes in, and she talks to the king, but not before she tells Mordecai and all the Jews, she says, fast for me for three days, and I'll do the same. And then at the end of the day, at, at the end of the three days, I'll go in and I'll talk to the king. And if I die, so be it. So she, she and the other Jews, they fast, and then the third day, Esther goes in to talk to the king, and he says, uh, what, what do you want, Esther? She, he, he gives her acceptance. To speak to her. And he says, I'll give you whatever you want, even if it's up to half the kingdom. She has so much favor in his eyes. And Esther says, I'd like to have a banquet with you and Haman. So they have a, a, a banquet together, and uh, Haman hears that he's in, invited to this banquet. He's very proud, he's very honored. He's gonna get to go to a banquet with just him and the queen. It's just Haman, the king, and the queen, and so it kind of fits his ego real well. And um, at the end of the banquet, Esther says, I'd like you to come to another banquet tomorrow. So she hasn't told the king her request yet. She's probably sensing a need for some timing and diplomacy here. And she asks him to come back to another banquet the next day. And Haman leaves this banquet in very high spirits, right? He's a high-ranking official. He's just had a lunch with the king and the queen and he's coming back for another one tomorrow he's feeling really good and then he leaves the palace and he runs into Mordecai again and Mordecai is still not bowing down to him and Haman does not like that at all and he goes home and he throws a party to invite his friends over because he wants to he wants everyone to know that he's going to a banquet with the king and the queen he's just come from one he's going to another one tomorrow he's bragging about it he says, everything's going well, except for this guy Mordecai. He won't bow down to me when I pass him by. And everyone says, you know, we got an idea. Why don't you set up a pole 75 feet high and impale him on it? If, if he won't bow down to you, let's raise him up 75 feet in the air and make an example out of that guy. And Haman says, that sounds like a great idea. Build the pole. Let's make an example out of this fool, and let's, let's put him up 75 feet in the air. So Haman and his crew is building this pole to impale Mordecai on. Meanwhile, the king is trying to sleep back at the palace, and he's having trouble sleeping. So he, so he orders that his record books of his reign be brought out to be read. Right? That'll, be, that'll put you to sleep. <laughs> and he gets those read to him, and it just so happens that the part that is read is the part about Mordecai saving his life and revealing the assassination plot against the king. And the king says, 
what was ever done for Mordecai since he saved my life? And he said, nothing was ever done. And now you have to see the irony in this. Just at this time, Haman shows up wanting to ask the king to impale Mordecai on a pole. But before Haman can ask this, the king asks, what should be done for someone that the king wants to honor? And, the, and, and Haman, being proud, he thinks in his mind, who could the king want to honor more than me? You know, who, who could he possibly want to honor more than me? So he dreams up what he would want to be done to himself. He said, well, you know, to the person that you want to honor, why don't you put your royal robes on him? And then why don't you find one of the king's own horses and parade him around the city? And then why don't you find one of the king's most noble princes to lead the parade, shouting, this is what is done for someone that the king honors. And uh, Haman's like, yeah, that'll, that'd be nice. And uh, the king says, great, why don't you do that for Mordecai? <laughs> and now Haman is, he's mortified that it's Mordecai, right? He just, he cannot believe that this guy that he wants to impale, he now has to parade around the city giving the highest honor to now, Haman goes home and he is upset that he just had to do this. But, you know, he's going to this banquet with the king and the queen tomorrow. So he, he's got this law where the Jews are going to be killed in the future. So, you know, I'll just put it out of his mind. At least he's got some things going for him. So he thinks. So he goes to this banquet with the king and the queen the next day. And... Esther, it's time for Esther to give her request. And Esther asks the king, she says, there's this law to kill all of the Jews. And by the way, I'm Jewish. The king doesn't know that up to this point. And the king says, who would do such a thing to, to put a law in place to kill my wife and all of her people? And she says, actually, that guy right there, Haman. <laughs> and the king gets really mad. And he says, let's, let's impale Haman. Yeah, that, that, that pole that, that he set up, let, let's, let's shish kebab that guy. And Esther asks, she says, well, can, can the law be changed about killing all of my people? And in Persia, the, the law couldn't be changed. Once the king had, had put a law in place, it could not be changed. But a new one could be written that could give the Jews the right to defend themselves and give themselves some protection. So a new law is written, and Mordecai himself gets to write this law. Under the king, but the king gives him permission to do that. And the Jews are allowed to protect themselves. And there's a great reversal that takes place in the book of Esther, what was supposed to happen to the Jews ends up happening to their enemies and the, the, the good that the enemies wanted to happen to themselves end up happening to the Jews. It's, it's an amazing story. Um, Mordecai ends up becoming prime minister in Persia, kind of like Joseph did in the book of Genesis in Egypt, and he continues to do good for uh, God and for his people. Now, there's, there's some really important truths that we need to apply to our own lives here. And I just want to point out four of them, four of them. And if you have your bulletin insert, you can follow along and fill in the blanks if that, that helps you out. Um, in Esther, the first one is that in Esther, God's name is not mentioned once, but his presence is everywhere at once. Throughout the entire story of Esther... God is precisely orchestrating things. Amazing details come together for God's glory and the good of his people. He is always unmistakably present behind the scenes. But throughout the book of Esther, the name of God is not mentioned one time. Now, I read some Bible background experts on this who study the Bible and other um, texts that happened at the time of the Bible. And they say this about the book of Esther. It says, not only is Esther the only biblical book that contains no reference to God, it also contains no written prayers, 
sacrifices, or religious observances. To say that this absence is unusual would be an understatement. Almost all ancient Near Eastern literature is permeated with religious language. The lack of religious reference in the book of Esther is highly remarkable and almost certainly intentional. So in other words, God knows that his name does not show up in the book of Esther, and he did that on purpose. You can't see his name, but he's the orchestrator of some amazing events that occur. He's sovereignly at work for the good of his people. And God has a lesson for us to take to heart in him intentionally leaving his name out of the book. And that's, in your life, God is present and he's active even when it doesn't seem like he is. As we've all been through a season in life, if we follow God for a while or Maybe even if we haven't, where we've turned to heaven and we said, God, where are you? What are you doing? I can't hear your voice. I can't feel your presence. And sometimes if, if we're honest, we're not doing a great job at listening. But other times in our life, God may intentionally be, be leaving his name out. He may be leaving his name out to take us deeper in our faith. He may be refining our faith, and he may be reminding us that he's present even when we don't feel it. He's always there. He's always working, and he may be giving us a reminder and a maturity in our faith that he is always present and always active even when we can't see his name. Sometimes God shouts in life, and sometimes he whispers, and sometimes he leaves his name out altogether. He's just quiet behind the scenes. But he's no less active in the moments where it's great and it's big and it's grand and it's glorious than when it's just quiet. Sometimes God gives an Exodus deliverance and sometimes he gives an Esther deliverance where it's just quiet and it's still but he's moving and he's working and he's present and powerful in both. In those moments where we're wondering, God, where are you? What are you doing? We need to remember what Jesus promised his disciples. He said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Is God faithful to his promises or what? He will never leave us. He will never forsake us, not even for a moment. I heard a great quote in a sermon that I, I have taken with me. that said, when you can't see God's hand, trust God's heart. A lot of times we're looking around in life and we want to see God do something. We can't see he's not moving as we would expect him to. And we can't see God's hand like we want to. In those seasons, we need to trust God's heart. That he's the God who gave his life for us. He's promised to never leave us or forsake us. And he's faithful to his promises. He wants our best and we can trust his heart that he's for us and he's good. And he's faithful to always be with us. You remember in, in the book of Genesis, Jacob, one night he has a dream and he wakes up from this dream. And listen what he says after the dream. He, it says, Jacob awoke from the sleep and it says, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. There might be a season of life where we need to awake as if from a sleep and we need, we need the realization that God is in this place and I didn't even know it. He's been with me all along and I didn't even realize it. It's kind of like a, a, a radio that you have in your car where the, the radio waves are always going through the air. But unless you're dialed in, you can't, you can't hear it. There might need to be an awakening moment where we say, God is in this place. He's never left me for a second, and I didn't know it. So Esther's a, a, a reminder to us that God is with us. He is present. He is good. He is always there. Do we know it? Do we know it? A second main truth that we see in the book of Esther is that God uses the actions of his people to accomplish his purposes. Now, John touched on this last week in the book of Ezra, and we see it again in the book of Esther. And really, it's something that we see throughout the entire Bible, that God uses the actions of his people to accomplish his purposes. Esther had to be reminded that she had a God-given purpose. In fact, in the book of Esther, it didn't seem like Esther was originally planning on sticking her neck out for her people and intervening like she did. 
And Mordecai had to remind her, said, Esther, you've been given a purpose by God. I can, I can see that God has a plan in your life and he's positioned you for a purpose. He has a plan for you and you need to press into that plan. And to Esther's credit, she stepped into that plan and that purpose at great risk to herself. But she had to be reminded, you have a purpose. God has positioned you for such a time as this. Step into that purpose. And in your life, maybe you need to be reminded like Esther that God has a purpose for your life. He wants to use you as part of his plan. He uses people to accomplish his purposes in life and he wants to use you. God's given humanity collectively and you and I individually the great privilege of taking part in his work here on earth. And sometimes we can forget that we've been given a purpose. Sometimes we can feel insignificant or like our contribution isn't going to matter that much. But in those moments, we can't believe those lies. God created you on purpose. None of us are an accident. And he's given us a plan. And he's, he's given you gifts. He's given you talents. He's given you some sphere of influence. He's given you friends and family members. What gifts and talents has God given you and how can you use those to take part in his purpose here on earth? Who do you know at work or at school or at home who doesn't know the Lord yet? Maybe God has positioned you for such a time as this to make a difference in the lives of those around you. A lot of times we can face the temptation just to be discouraged. A lot, a lot of bad things can happen in the world. And we can look at all the different things that can happen. And we, can be, we can be discouraged by those things. Man, this world is, it can be discouraging and heartbreaking and hard to live in at times. And, and it can be tempting to become negative. But maybe God has placed you in the darkness to be a light. Maybe God has positioned you to be a purpose and to take part in the plan that he's, he wants to fulfill right around you. Esther also reminds us, as you consider your purpose, remember to press into your purpose through the power of prayer. In a way, the whole book of, of Esther actually has a turning point around prayer. Prayer is not specifically mentioned, but they fast for three days. And no doubt, prayer was a part of that process. And Esther and all the Jews, they gave themselves to fasting and to prayer. And then the whole book of Esther has a turning point. I mean, the Jews, they, it looks like their back is against the wall. They're in a corner. It looks like they're hopeless. And then they become dependent on the Lord and they fast and they pray. And then there's a turning point. It seems like there's no way of escape. And then the Lord parts the seas once again in their midst. We each need to press into our purpose through humble prayer. And prayer is just that dependence of saying, Lord, I can, I can never do this without you and I would never want to. I know that you have a plan and a purpose for me, and I know that you're going to be present with me every step of the way. So help me to believe that, and help me to press into that and walk with you by your power and strength and fulfill the purpose that you've given me. So a second main truth that we see in the book of Esther is that God has a purpose and a plan for each of our lives that he wants us to press into through the power of prayer and live out. God has given you a life for such a time as this. You're not going to live here on earth forever. The people in your life aren't going to live here on earth forever, but God has given you a purpose for such a time as this. How does God want to use you right here and right now? Press into prayer about that purpose and live that out. A third truth that we're reminded of in the book of Esther is that Esther's an example to each of us of laying it all on the line for God. Esther gives us an example of putting it all on the line for God. When Esther's confronted with the very real possibility of dying for her faith, she says something in chapter 4 that we should all have in our heart. It should be something that we all live by. She says, have everyone fast for me, and I'll do the same. And if I die, I die. That's her attitude in life. She said, let's place this whole situation in God's hands. Let's place my whole life in the Lord's hands. And if I die, 
so be it. And she's an example that we should give everything to God. We should be willing to give everything for God. You know, we as Christians come from a, a long heritage of people who were willing to give everything for God. Esther, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Rahab, they were all willing to give it all for God and place their lives in God's hands. You know, next Sunday is actually an international day of prayer for the persecuted church. And we're going to be reminded that there's many people throughout the world who still literally give their lives for their faith in Christ. And Christians throughout history have given their life for Christ. And we'll have some devotions that follow up the day of prayer for the persecuted church. And I hope that it encourages us and inspires us to live more fully for God in our own lives. The book of Hebrews reminds us about our heritage uh, in the Christian faith and how many people have been persecuted for their faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, it reminds us that followers of God were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They were placed in, uh, sorry, they placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection, completely placed their hope in what God is going to do after the resurrection. Some were jeered at and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained and put in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half. And others were killed by the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. We have a heritage of the Christian faith where our Christian forefathers and foremothers, they've been through a lot for Christ. And we live in a time such as this. This is our time to live it out for God and to give him all that we have in our everyday lives. And it's so easy to just push God to the margins of our life, to not keep him central in our day-to-day -day life. And we need to remember the, the people of old who have been through so much, some people were sawed and tooed for their faith. We should be willing to give everything for God and his purposes. The fourth reminder I want us to remember from the book of Esther is that God proves himself faithful to those who follow him. The story of Esther reminds us that God is faithful to those who put their trust in him. God didn't leave Esther abandoned as she stuck her neck out. For her people, God miraculously wove together events so that he would be glorified and his people would be saved. It's almost, it's almost humorous how involved and how, how in control God is in the book of Esther. Proud Haman, he wanted Mordecai to bow down to him. And instead, he has to parade Mordecai around and watch everyone give honor to him. Haman was in support of there being a law of all the men, all the women having to listen to their husbands and all the Jews being killed. And at the end of the book, he's begging for his life from a Jewish woman. God has a sense of humor. Proud Haman wanted Mordecai to be impaled on the pole, and instead he himself is impaled on the pole that he set up. Psalm 37, 12 through 15 says, The wicked plot against the godly. They snarl at at them in defiance, but the Lord just laughs, for he sees their judgment coming. The wicked draw their swords and their strings and their bows to kill the poor and the oppressed, to slaughter those who do right, but the swords will stab their own hearts and their bows will be broken. God is a God of reversals, amazing reversals that we see in the book of Esther, and as we trust in God, he will save us. And that's what Esther reminds us. When our trust is in him, God will show himself faithful. When we trust in him, he will save us. It may not always be in the way that we want. And it may not always be in the time that we want. But God will prove himself faithful. Remember, he even sent his own son to the cross. Jesus died. He gave his life. But there was a resurrection planned. And if God calls us to something like giving our life... For the faith, you can bet he has a greater purpose planned. He has a resurrection purpose planned. 
The Apostle Paul went through numerous trials when he was on earth. He was whipped. He was put in prison. He was beaten. He was chained. But he reminded the Christians always, he said, remember, we're persecuted, but we're not abandoned. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Keep giving your life for God. Keep giving him your everything. Because if you live for him, that's what victory looks like. Esther has some amazing truths that we need to apply in our own lives. I mentioned four of them this morning. That God's present and he's active in our lives even when it doesn't feel like it. God has a purpose in our lives that he wants us to prayerfully press into. And that we should be willing to give everything for God. Give him our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. And that ultimately God will save us if our trust is is in him. Now Esther also gives us one more important reminder. And our interpretation of the book would be incomplete without pointing it out. Because the book of Esther points to Jesus Christ. You know, we too, like the, like the Jews in the book of Esther, were backed into a corner because of our sin. And there was a legal edict against us because of our sin that we deserve to die. And it seemed like death was certain. It seemed like the enemy had a victory. Haman was sure of it. Satan was sure of it. Because of your sin, you deserve to die. But because we have a friend in high places who is willing to put themselves on the line for us, we were saved. Jesus is our friend in high places who is willing to stick his neck out for you and I and intervene on our behalf. And because he gave his life For us, you and I are saved. Where it seemed hopeless, there was hope. Because we have a friend who is willing to become one of us and intercede on our behalf. But whereas Esther never had to give her life, Jesus did give his life. And the punishment that belonged to us fell on him. And we're allowed to go free because of what Christ has done for us. At the book of es- in, the, in the end of Esther 9.22, it says, it says something that relates to our own lives. It says, the Jews gained relief from their enemies. Their sorrow was turned to gladness and their mor- mourning into joy. Is that not our story in Christ? Our sorrow has been turned to gladness and our mourning to joy because we have a friend in high places who was willing to intercede on our behalf and lay down his life. Let's pray together this morning.